we have to figure out how do people tick and then help them be better at who they already are so that they become the best version of the person they already are. And most people's lives would actually turn out very different if they had a better yeah. idea of who they were. Hey, I'm Lisa Hugo, and I am obsessed with helping other people find their voices so they can go out and take on the world, be seen as an authority, an expert, and grow their business by sharing that knowledge and expertise with others. Now, I studied performing arts, and I spent 20 years of my career traveling the world as a professional singer-songwriter. I teach you the secrets to speak up and be heard, overcome your fears, and then use these skills to build a business and a life that you love and that could change both your own life and the lives of others. This is your one-stop shop for all things that are going to help you to build a life on your terms. This is Impact Through Voice. Well, welcome back to the Impact Through Voice podcast. I'm your host, Lisa Hugo, and today I'm back in the studio and I'm joined by Mark Laudi. Mark is a former CNBC TV presenter. He's been on radio. He is a public speaker and he is an author, but he's now also helping leaders and executives to develop their public speaking skills and their media skills. So I'm very much looking forward to this conversation. We've got a lot to talk about. Welcome, <laughs> Mark. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, great to have you here. Well, I'm going to dive, first of all, a bit into your background and also what you focus on, and then we'll see where the conversation takes us. Eh? Sure. So tell us a bit about your whole background in your words. Well, you, you've already mentioned uh, my last job in the media was as an anchor at uh, CNBC in Asia Pacific. But my radio career actually started when I was 21 years old. Uh, I moved from university in Australia straight into a regional radio uh, broadcasting role, current affairs in South Australia. Uh, I moved to Singapore 27 years ago. And for the last 17 years, I've been coaching business leaders, as you mentioned, in the communication skills and all the various iterations where that makes sense. Great. So you're in Dubai, but you're from Singapore. So welcome to Dubai. How Thank are you. you finding it here? Well, apart from hot, uh, this is not my first trip to Dubai, obviously. Uh, and and I, I do have quite a number of uh, people in this region who I go to see. Okay. So certainly not the first visit, but uh, certainly a dynamic one and uh, one that I don't need to tell you, never changing. Okay. We, we actually find right now this is the perfect time of the year to be here. It's cooling down. It's absolutely stunning. I was out for a walk yesterday and I actually posted that on my Instagram. If you're ever coming to Dubai, I feel now is the perfect time to be here from a climate perspective. Right. So in your training with executives and leaders, you use a very specific formula. And I want to start by diving into this formula or assessment, Clifton Strengths. Can you enlighten us a little bit about this? I have done the assessment, and so we're going to dive into what came out of my assessment. But first, give us an overview of what this assessment tells us and how, how we do it. Sure. Clifton Strengths uh, was founded by an American psychologist named Donald Clifton many, many years ago. Uh, and since then has evolved to be a personality assessment that's used by companies and individuals. It's usually used for personal and career development, but we applied for communications coaching. It used to be called Gallup Strengths Finder. That may be a, a name that you're more familiar mm -hmm. with. And in essence, it reflects to you what your personality is like. You take the assessment, you end up with a report, which should read very accurately, where you could read it and say, yes, that's me. Is that which what happened to you? Which is exactly what happened to me. I got it and I thought, wow, this is so true to me and my personality. Yes, yeah, so accurate. And yeah. so the reason why we implemented this for communications coaching is because of the problems that usually arise when we don't take care of the personality behind the microphone. Mm -hmm. and, and perhaps uh, you might have had this experience too. You'll have three or four executives in a room, possibly more, and you're going through the do's and don'ts of how to appear on stage, how to appear on camera, how to carry yourself, and obviously those communications techniques, the tips and tricks. Yeah. At the end of that process, you then usually sit the executives down in front of a camera for them to practice. And if you're a business leader, obviously that's what you're there for, right? You're looking to put these skills yes. into practice and hopefully you'll be able to carry it off. But I'm certain you've also noticed whether you've taken uh, a, a training workshop or run one, mm -hmm. 
that in a group of, say, three or four, there are some people who do this really well, and there are some who just don't. There, there are some, for example, who are able to articulate a clear message that's impactful, interesting, draws the viewer in. Mm -hmm. But then there are other guests, when their turn comes on camera, who seemingly go off on an extreme number of tangents, or they are so disarmingly honest on a particular topic that their corporate handlers, their communications handlers, then step in and say, hey, you know, you, you can't talk about this. Right. Um, similarly with data points, which, again, lots of uh, presenters need to bring data points in. Why do we need data in a presentation? Well, um, why do we need data? Obviously, everybody in corporate is going to have data that they need to present. That's right. Yeah. And, and it adds so much credibility. Yes. You can't just say words. You sound like you're just make, giving opinions. We need the data. And yet, and yet, we have some people who, when it comes to the practice run, are very good at articulating the data. And there are some who, by self-confession, say, you know, Mark, I'm not a numbers person. Mm -hmm. And so the result of that is that at the end of these workshops in years gone by, there were always some performers, some executive uh, executives or corporate spokespeople who came out of the studio feeling energized. And there were some who would say, thank goodness that's over. Yeah. I will never want to be on camera. Yes. So obviously, when you're a presentation coach, you ask yourself why that is. I mean, they're part of the same work. They're sitting next to each other. Yes, but they're, they have different personalities. But they have different personalities. And that's why five years ago we turned to Clifton Strengths mm -hmm. as a way of assessing what the personality is. And here we are five years later and 3,000 Clifton Strengths reports later. Okay. And so there are a number of home truths that we figured out. First, we are all different in exactly the same ways. Okay. And that makes this very usable because when somebody comes in with their Clifton Strengths report, we can pretty much assess straight away what sort of personality they are. Mm -hmm. Next step is that understanding what their inclinations or sometimes compulsions are. We can also assess very much straight away whether they have stage fright whether they want to be on camera, like the first person I mentioned, or desperately don't want to be on mm -hmm. camera, like the last person I mentioned. And that then, of course, is where the magic happens, because we can then, based on the assessment, not only predict somebody's problems, but solve them. Okay. I'm curious to know, how can you solve the problem of somebody who is so fearful of being on camera? It's not, it's not a part of them. And they really don't like it. Yes. How can you get them to enjoy it? Well, here is the thing. 3,000 Clifton Strengths reports later, it turns out that there are 12 personality traits which give rise to that nervousness. And because these are all distinct personality traits, they are actually all different forms of stage fright. Mm -hmm. So, for example, um, if you have somebody who has what's called a restorative talent, right? So in your Clifton Strengths report, look for the word restorative. Yeah. It's one of the 34 personality traits. People with a restorative mindset aren't just good at restoring things. We can all solve problems. Mm -hmm. But they are obsessed with solving problems. Um, and it's, it's accompanied them throughout their entire lives. Perhaps when they were at school, they took an exam, they got an excellent grade, maybe 95%. But instead of being out there celebrating with their classmates, they were back home commiserating, why did I miss the last five right. points? Yeah. And this sort of personality trait permeates so many other aspects of their lives. They are uh, obsessed with meeting standards, plugging gaps, bringing things back on track, solving problems. Mm -hmm. Their form of nervousness comes from seeing problems in themselves. So just as they're attuned to seeing the shortcomings, where did I go wrong? Yeah. They then say to themselves, I am full of shortcomings. Now, this form of nervousness is very different from many of the others. Mm -hmm. Another talent theme or personality trait is called individualization. So once again, we can all treat people indiv as individuals, but people with an individualization uh, talent theme are obsessive people watchers. 
we can all watch people, but they're usually the sort who sit in a transit lounge and before the boarding call for their flight has come up, they would have looked around, sussed everybody out, and possibly made little judgment calls about them. So exceptionally yeah. gifted in reading people. They have stage fright when they're on camera and there's nobody to read. They're usually yeah. the sort of person who then says in a Teams or a Zoom call, hey guys, can I get everybody to please turn your cameras on? Mm -hmm. Because they need that input. So when you put them on camera, doesn't work. They need to look at somebody. Yeah. And I could go on. As I said, there yeah, are yeah. 12 different distinct, you see just from these two examples mm -hmm. how different these are. Yeah. The solution to all of these 12 forms of stage fright, therefore, is not to say, smile, relax, and, you know, take a deep breath and, and you know, move across the stage. It doesn't address the underlying reason for why they have that stage fright, and therefore it doesn't cure it. Which is mindset then, or yeah, un understanding exactly where it's coming from and then being able to adapt them accordingly. Absolutely. Okay, I've done the test. Yes. Why don't we dive in a bit to what we discovered about me and my personality? Yes. Putting myself here on the line. Yes, and no surprise that you would because one of your talent themes so shows just how socially outgoing and gregarious you are. <laughs> That's not me telling you that. Firstly, you probably know that anyway, but also it says so in your report, right? So this is what the report looks like, and you can see that there are 34 of these talent themes. Please be aware that these are not skills, but mindsets. Mm -hmm. These are propensities or inclinations, natural, instinctive ways of thinking, not whether you can or not. Right, right? because so, that's something you develop. That's a skill which is developed. Exactly. Yeah. Right? Just like having a musical talent. You might have a good voice and, and perfect pitch, but it's really only once you develop it by reading sheet music, maybe picking up an instrument, learning how to play. Yep. That's how we turn a talent into strengths. Exactly. And the same goes for your personality. Mm -hmm. Step one is self-awareness. Step two is self-acceptance. Step three is self-regulation. And so what do we see in your report, Lisa? Here's a quick coaching session on the fly. In essence, we see that you have in your top 10, these are like your main personality traits, that you have six of these orange colored influencing talents. That is highly unusual. Most people have more of the purple colored executing talents. They're doers yeah. or more of the green colored strategic thinking talents. They're deep thinkers. Mm -hmm. um, also common, usually in number three position, is the blue colored relationship talents. They're very much people orientated. Right. You having six influencing talents is very rare, which means, and was probably explain, why you have a background on stage and in, in training. Yeah. So I found it very interesting. I, I went through it and I was like, wow, all of these are so connected with how I, I am. Yeah. Mm. And there's no doubting it. Yes, yeah. exactly. And so the, the issue, though, for us as communications coaches isn't necessarily people who already like to talk. Right. Most True. business leaders don't have these influencing talents. In fact, most people all over the world don't have these influencing talents. They're very, very few and far between. Right. And so, therefore, when you have a business leader who, you know, doesn't have a LinkedIn profile, doesn't like to be out there, mm -hmm. in other words, they only come for the training because their communications executive has told them to come. Yeah. That is really where the rubber meets the road. Okay. So I believe that any, everybody, a, a leader, they need to develop their personal brand and they need to be out there. If you're not visible, you're invisible. And so, yeah, I'm curious to know then, somebody who is quite the opposite of me, then how are you going to convince them and give them those skills that they can get out there? Yes. Well, first, if they don't want to. Exactly. The first thing to note here is that none of us are one track minds. You're not just activator. You're not just communication. Mm -hmm. You're not just maximizer. We are a combination of about, well, 10 to 12 mindsets. Of course, there are 34 in all. Yeah. And in essence, we have all of them. It's just that some of them we never, there are some comfort zones we just never go into. Right. 
Um, to liken this to lenses, and you be aware of the phrase, that's you know the way that the lens that I view the world through, right? And people mm -hmm. often use that phrase. Yeah. We we have in essence these these ten lenses. One, two, three, four, five, mm -hmm. six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah. Where's number thirty-four? Well, it's somewhere around the back. Behind you, right? And yeah. we never look out the back of our yeah. head. So, so the aim is to polish up the mindsets that we have, sharpen the focus mm -hmm. on the lenses that we have, rather than try to tell people you need to be using this lens, which is really not their comfort zone. So let's say somebody comes in with a deliberative mindset. You'll recognize people with deliberative because they tend to be very socially cautious. They're the ones who sit at the back of a meeting room and don't say very much. Mm -hmm. um, often though, when they finally speak, they have far more considered and carefully thought through things to say. And that usually blows everybody away. That's when you hear people say, wow, still waters run deep. Mm -hmm. Now the thing about the deliberative mindset though, is that it isn't at all interested in the limelight. People with deliberative would much rather be at the back of the meeting room right. and not speak. They'd much rather not be out on stage. They'd much rather not have a LinkedIn profile because they don't like the exposure and the vulnerability. They see that as a risk that needs to be managed. But they're not just deliberative. They're nine other mindsets. Yeah. And so recently I had a, a client who uh, works in a postal service, a national postal service. She has one of these deliberative mindsets did not want to be in the media. But it just so happens that there was a particular morning she was invited to speak on radio about the launch of a new stamp, seeing that she works for the Postal Service. Okay. And her colleague was supposed to do the interview, but dumped this on her lap in the last minute. She was not happy, mm -hmm. right? Because people with deliberative, they're immediately thinking, oh my gosh, there's so much risk. And they then set about trying to weigh up all their options and how, do, how can I proceed in the path of least risk? But she's not just deliberative. It turned out that when we reflected on her talent themes that she also has a belief mindset. Now, we can all believe, mm -hmm. right? But when you have a belief mindset, which Lisa, as I scroll through your Clifton Strengths report, this is number 32. Ooh. So I'm not sure you can relate to this quite so much. <laughs> but people with a belief mindset are obsessive about staying true to their values, morals, and principles. They can come across as a little bit stoic or stubborn, mm -hmm. refusing to do things that's against their values. Yep. Uh, they often come across as, uh, uh, you know, very uh, insistent that if I don't believe in it, I don't want to do it, right? Very ethical. Right. Hardwired. Yeah. We can all be ethical, yeah. but they're hardwired to be yes. focusing on their values. And so she had this belief mindset. And, and so when the radio interview then went to air, she was not at all hesitant about being on radio. Okay. Because she switched out of that deliberative comfort zone into her belief comfort zone. It was fantastic. Wow. Now she spoke with the courage of her convictions. Yeah. And she talked about how important stamps are. In a world of email, stamps are a showcase of our nation's achievement. They are ambassadors to the world. And, and so listening to her, you can first of all mm -hmm. see how much she firmly believes what she's talking about, how convincing yeah. she is. But more importantly, she was not hesitant because she got into a different comfort zone. Interesting, interesting how we can, yeah, focus on those different strengths and pull that out of somebody. I had a client who was similar to what you're saying. He would sit at the back of the room. He would say very little, but because of that, he was losing out on opportunities yes. as well. But his f reason for not speaking up was he felt that every time he did speak up, people didn't take notice of him. And so for me, what we worked on then was developing his voice because he did have a very soft voice when he spoke. Right. Mm -hmm. He didn't have any strength in his voice. And so that's an aspect where I work with people, which is quite different, to just help them build the skill that they need to then be able to then confidently get out there and do what they need to do. Yes. Well, you see how wide and varied we all are. You know, 33 million Clifton strengths. There hasn't once been a repetition. Mm -hmm. truly are all unique. Interesting, yeah. Um, and incidentally, it also transcends cultural and gender uh, boundaries, which I'm happy to refer to. But so, and it's it's certainly important that they learn how to project, 
right? So, so not yeah. taking away at all from the skills and the, the tips and the tricks, the investment in, in their talent themes. But to investigate why this person did not want to be uh, speaking up uh, is an important consideration. Um, now, obviously, I haven't seen his Clifton Strengths report. Yeah. Okay. But so, what sort of personalities usually don't speak up? They are, on occasion, people with deliberative who, as I mentioned, they'll think of the best thing to say better than anybody else yeah, in the room. Yep. It's just that they don't get to that until after the meeting's already yep. finished. Oh, why didn't I say that? I missed my opportunity. Yes, that's right. That's right. Um, but it could also be uh, any number of the other talent themes. Perhaps this person has an intellectual mindset where they need to decompress and, and usually, without even thinking about it, spend an hour a day after everybody else in the household has gone to sleep to decompress and, and kind of unpack the day. They're often very thoughtful. Um, perhaps it is restorative that he feels that if he speaks up, then it, he might be saying the wrong thing. Right? So we'd want to know what is the underlying personality trait that is leading to this. And then I mentioned earlier self-regulating. Self-regulation happens in two ways. One is that you dial up or down. Or two is that you switch. Just like my earlier example, switching out of deliberative and into belief. Mm -hmm. And it is having your hand on the dial. This is why Clifton Strengths is used as a career and personal development tool. Yes. It's about your how do you get a good grip on yourself. How do you right? react to situations? How do you lead? In a mindful way, yes. right? Most of the times, we're all in automatic transmission. If you learn to drive on a manual, you'll know how much torque you can get out of the car yeah. when you are in control of the gear stick. And that's, in essence, the same thing. Normally, we don't think about what our talent themes are. But imagine if you did. Now, how you come across is within your personal grasp. Your behaviors and words are no longer dictated by circumstance or context. You decide how you want to come across. You decide which comfort zone to get into. And so from self-awareness, self-acceptance, very important, mm -hmm. we then get to self-regulation. And if we do that well, then we get to the next three selves. Self-mastery, I'm very good at being who I am. Self-confidence, I'm so good at keeping myself under control. I know I can deal with any situation. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, the top of Maslow's hierarchy self-actualization yeah yeah that was in the book I was reading that yeah so that's that's really the the journey that that a lot of these executives uh, have to go on uh, and and it's no surprise that a number of them come with all sorts of hang-ups that have accompanied them their entire careers um, another example I could give you was uh, a civil servant who, who came to my studio and 45 years old, thereabouts, mm -hmm. so has been in the workforce for 25 years. And her first words as she entered the studio was, I'm only here because my boss signed me up. <laughs> no hellos, right? <laughs> just just cut straight right, to the okay. chase. I'm, I, I don't really want to be here. And as we then went through her talent profile, we discovered that she had this restorative mindset, which is in essence the, the devil on your shoulder that critiques you for everything you say. Mm -hmm. Um, while she's presenting, she's already thinking about all the things she did wrong. Her colleagues think that it's a great presentation, 95%, yep. but she's obsessed with the 5% she didn't get. And usually if you have a restorative mindset, this then, you know, you're self-reflecting, self-criticizing, even while you're on stage, you then end up making more mistakes that you can self-criticize about. Yep. And often these presentations turn into train wrecks. Right, you know. yeah. However... She wasn't just restorative. She also had what's called command. Now, command, I notice in your report, is number 14. So maybe you okay. can relate to this a little. People with a command mindset aren't just good at taking charge. We can all take charge, right? Mm -hmm. But they have a propensity, an inclination to step up. Yep. This is uh, the sort of person you see where, let's say, a child is running out onto the road. Somebody with command will leap in and grab yep. the child's arm. Or you see somebody falling down an escalator. Everybody else is standing around not knowing what to do. Command steps up, mm -hmm. hits the stop button. Yeah. And so this is, again, not just a skill. This is a mindset. People with command can't help but to step up. Now, it also has some drawbacks. You're in a restaurant. You call for the bill. If the waiter doesn't bring the bill to you within two minutes, there's a good chance you'll step up to the counter and demand to see the bill there and then. But... 
this particular civil servant also had a command mindset. Okay. She wasn't just restorative, she was nine others, including command. So we talked about what does command look like for you? How does it show up for you? And then she talked about how there was a particular incident in the office. It was late on a Friday. The minister had called in demanding answers for something. She took charge. I naturally gravitated to taking charge. As she's speaking, she, you could see the confidence come through. As she's recalling what command looks and feels like for her. She's fluid. She's confident. No sign of that annoying devil on your shoulder little voice. She gave the presentation. It was fantastic. So I asked her, that was awesome. How did you do that? Didn't you have that little naggy voice self-criticizing you as you're speaking? She said, no. I got into command and I told that voice to shut up. And so here she was, mid-40s, having dragged around this form of stage fright for 25 mm -hmm. years. And we solved it in four hours. That's incredible. I find that very, very interesting. This is a very different approach. Okay, uh, somebody who, I mean, this is the kind of person who would then come away as well and they'd be lying in bed at night and they'd be thinking all the terrible things that they, they did. That's it. Um, and and it, they'll dwell on it for days and days afterwards. Yes, And they can't so. get it out. That's right, That's yes. That's re rhetoric. Th that, uh, Restoric. Uh, restorative. Restorative. Re restorative. Right. Right. Um, and uh, exactly. And in, in fact, uh, I could tell you dozens of stories. I had a client who was heading to an annual general meeting. Uh, she also had a responsibility mindset, which is your number 12. So again, we can all be responsible, right? But when you have a wiring for responsibility, you own commitments. You lie awake in bed agonizing over even the smallest promise that you weren't able to keep. Yes. You are always on time. If you're not, you message ahead. You are a person of integrity. And of course, when you then arrive at the venue five, ten minutes late, you apologize profusely and probably end up blaming the traffic or the parking. Yes, that sounds very familiar. <laughs> right, that's, that's responsibility. Now, uh, this particular client heading to an AGM had both responsibility and restorative. And exactly as you say, she spent three weeks agonizing over owning that commitment, mm -hmm. demonstrating her trustworthiness and reliability. And three weeks after the AGM, she then spent three weeks agonizing for all the things she should have said better. Mm -hmm. So those are two talent themes that give her problems. Yeah. So then again comes the question, how do we self-regulate that? And then we unpack, hmm, great that you have responsibility. What a virtuous mindset, always driven to do the right thing or else you'll have a guilty conscience. Well. What actually is the right thing at the AGM? What does serving your audience well look like? How can you demonstrate your trustworthiness and reliability? Is it really about knowing absolutely everything there is to know about the business so that you need three weeks to prepare for it? It's the AGM. You're one of five speakers. Maybe nobody will even ask you a question. None mm -hmm. of the shareholders. Mm -hmm. So. Maybe you don't need to agonize for three weeks. Maybe you can say, I've done my preparation. It's not as much as I usually do. But I'm self-regulating because I'm deciding how much is enough. You're self-regulating by saying, I'm going to serve my audience better by having some key points and deferring additional questions to the annual report rather than you know, spending three weeks trying to bone up on everything right. in, the, in, the, in the meeting. Same with restorative. What does the perfect presentation actually look like? If you're the sort who always goes for 100%, what does 100% sound like? And so usually the, the point where people arrive is the realization that if they were to give a 100% perfect presentation, 100% perfect? What does that sound like? There is no perfection. There is no perfection. Worse, if you were able to achieve that, you would sound like an AI-driven chatbot. Yes. Do audiences but connect with a chatbot? No, we connect emotionally. Exactly. Yeah. So 95% is actually 100%. 95% is perfect. If you are at risk of giving a 100% perfect presentation, that is the imperfection. It's all the conversational artifacts 
right? It's all the little imperfections in speech. That's what makes it perfect. It makes you a real person, which people will connect with a real person. Exactly. Yeah. Right, so that's the form of regulation, mm. self-regulation that we then talk about. Okay. So people get a new perspective and get a grip on that gear stick and be able to say, okay, I'm not going to do things the way that I did for the last 99 times, the 100th time, I'm in charge of how I feel. Mm. Now, of course, she had not only responsibility and restorative, she had eight other talent themes. Well, let's look at the rest of your personality traits. Mm. Just like my postal service uh, officer, yep. how could you switch out of responsibility and restorative into one of the eight other talent themes? So understanding where you are strong, once you know that, you can play to it, you can enhance those strengths. And as you say, if you're weak in, in one, then you, or one which is holding you back, holding you back, then you switch across to another. I really, I it. love this. You got it. So if somebody wants to do the Clifton Strengths assessment, is it possible that they can do it? Is there somewhere they can go? Is it something they have to pay for? Absolutely. Store.gallop.com. The Gallup organization obviously charges for the code, mm -hmm. and it's probably the best investment you'll ever make. Yeah. Um, most people come away from these workshops uh, changed. There are other similar assessments out there. I, I can't remember the names of them, but yes. very comparative, would you say? Or this, you, this one is... Top of the top of the list. Well, there, there are a number of others. Clearly, um, the the reason why I gravitate to Clifton Strengths is because it is so granular and so detailed. And once again, you only need to look at your your own report to see that, mm. right? In in your report, you then have. I'll, I won't zoom in too much, haha. <laughs> but you know, yeah, full detailed, full uh, details. understanding of what that means. Exactly, yep. and, and, how, and how this might manifest in your personality. Mm. Uh, and, and so I find this much, much more useful than yep. knowing, for example, that you are a, 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 a green-blue. Yes. Or, or that you are an ISTJ. Yes. What, what do you do with that information? Yeah, it's too broad, yeah. whereas this is extremely detailed. Very, very action-oriented. So I, I want to highlight this in your book here, uh, Play to Your Strengths When Presenting. You wrote this this year? It was published this year? It's over the last couple of years. It yeah. is the, the, the collective wisdom, I guess, okay. accumulated from my clients. So I, I highly recommend do the test and then read the book. Now, what I did was I started to read the book all the way through. And then when you're reading things about thing you're, that don't associate with your own personality and your own character, it's like, okay, okay, I've got to get through this again. But as you've highlighted, it's a, a pick and choose, basically. You go through the book with your own assessment in mind so that you yes. can build on your strengths and understand how am I going to, to react to this situation. You're given a, a deadline. You've got to present something. You've got to then come up with your headline. You've got to come up with your stories. You've got to come up with your outline. Mm. So you go and you read the section about how do I approach this and how can I do it better. Based right? on your personality. Exactly. Correct. Yeah, yes. it's, it's very, very interesting. And I recommend, is it on Amazon? Is It, it is, amazon.sg. Okay. Uh, and and just to amplify the, the point that you're making there, um, most of the times, uh, when people come to the studio, they're quite apprehensive. They, they fear that they need to do things on camera that don't come naturally mm -hmm. to them. The, the aim here is to ensure that we actually keep people in their comfort zones. And I recognize that that's unorthodox when we constantly, you know, uh, uh, here, yes. you know, step out of your comfort zone. So that's not to say that you shouldn't learn new things, right? But, but staying in your comfort zone is in essence about understanding firstly through the Clifton Strengths Assessment what your comfort zones actually are. Yeah. Right? And to some extent, even at my age, we all like to think that we know until you read the Clifton Strengths mm -hmm. report and then you realize, wow, yes, actually I, I never realized this about me. And and so having identified your comfort zones, the aim is to stay in them, build on them by building them out with techniques and skills. And that's how you build yourself up. I'm curious to know what your top five are. I thought you would ask that question. Well, I'm also a broadcaster. And like you, I'm also a performer in a sense. We're yes. doing a performance now. Yes. But we have to realize that you and I are very different from virtually everybody else on the planet. These orange-colored influencing talents, of which you have six in your top ten, 
is highly unusual. Uh, most people are more of the doers, the thinkers, mm, or the, the people saying. people. And, and so, in my experience, trying to teach introverts, and I use the label with caution, yeah. how to, you know, training introverts in being extroverts doesn't work. They'll leave the studio and then they'll say, oh, well, you know, thank God that's over. We have to figure out how do people tick and then help them be better at who they already are so that they become the best version of the person they already are. So your strengths are also in the in the influencing. In the influencing, a large, a large absolutely. portion of them, same, yeah. Yes, and like you, you know, when I was in television, I also thought everybody was like me. Yeah. We all tend to see the world, we think, well, everybody can do this, until you realize actually just how, well, as I said earlier, how different we are in the yes. same ways. Yeah. So. Uh, I, I also, I mean, talking the introvert there, I do believe that an introvert still has to be able to switch on and change out of that. Let's maybe change is perhaps the wrong word, but be able to have the skills to be out there in front of an audience, be, be good, be impactful, and then they can come off that stage again and withdraw back into their other personality traits or Absolutely. characteristics. Absolutely right. And and more so now than ever before. It might be that, you know, in the past, uh, certainly when I left television, most of the training was for being on television or on radio. But in truth, how many people actually still watch television and listen to the radio on a daily basis like we did 20, 30 years ago? We were talking about this before. Netflix, we have other ways to absorb our information. Yes. We don't I don't think I have a television channel in my house. I like to watch BBC mm -hmm. when I'm in a hotel room. That's the yes. first thing I'll put on in the morning. Yes. But now we're consuming everything on our phones, on social platforms, and absolutely reading through you know, the newspaper. If we want to read it, we read it on our tablets, on our devices. Podcasts, videos. Podcasts. Yep. Right? So in that environment, you really, as a business leader, you really have no choice, sorry to say. You know, your company needs you to step up. Yes. Your organization needs you to fly the flag, to go out with your subject matter expertise or to push whatever other um, mission the company has and, and ensure that, that your voice is heard. No arguments. It just doesn't come naturally to most people. And, uh, and, and you have to realize that this often then becomes very career limiting. Yes. If, if you're not willing to step up, yeah. If you're not seen, you're not heard, then your opportunities are limited. Absolutely. Yeah. So, and, and that's really the, the two worlds that we need to bring together. Uh, so many companies are producing in-house content that they then upload to their in-house YouTube channel. In-house podcasts. In-house podcasts. Yeah. Uh, and if you're the, like the regional vice president or, or the, even the chief executive or the chairman, and you have a dislike for cameras, you know, no number of retakes is going to solve the problem for you. You, you. you have no choice but to figure out, how can I make this a comfort zone? The only thing I would add, though, is about the, the word introversion, introverts. Mm. Um, very common. And of course, if, we, if the world was black and white, we could say, yes, introvert and extrovert. In truth, we actually all have various forms of introversion. Yes, I believe that too. And various forms of extroversion. Mm -hmm. It's just like the American states. People talk to, about them as being the blue states and the red states. They're all purple. They're different shades of purple, right? So um, introversions, for example, you have activator, communication, significance maximizer. But would you be surprised to learn that the learner mindset, which is a green-colored strategic thinking mindset, your number 30, mm -hmm is actually often comes across as extroverted. Have you ever been in a class, maybe at, at university, maybe it's a, it's a seminar being held in the company, and there's a colleague who just constantly, incessantly asks questions. Yeah. So they come across as an extrovert, but actually the reason they ask so many questions is because they're hungry to learn. People with a learner talent aren't just good at learning, we can all learn, right? Mm. But they have an insatiable need for learning. They usually have multiple degrees, they love the experience of learning, not necessarily getting the degree at the end of it or applying what they've learned. 
Yeah. Right? So they're energized by learning. And that's why they often come across as, you know, raising their hand and asking more questions. And yet, yet it's an it's a strategic thinking talent. Yeah. Right? Similarly with people with discipline, which is your number twenty nine. Doesn't mean you're undisciplined, but okay. pe- people with a discipline mindset gravitate towards SOPs, formula, guardrails. When you send them a calendar invite without an agenda, they'll complain. I, what, what are we doing? What's the structure of this meeting going to be? Yes. So it is a purple colored executing talent because they're extremely efficient. Once they know the five step plan or the workflow, they'll get to work. They are like a machine, right? The way they go about it. When they get on stage and they follow the processes and the SOPs for presenting, they are just as efficient and come across as extroverts. Mm. And yet it's not an orange-colored influencing talent. So just from those two examples, you can see that even if you are not a natural talker like the two of us here today, um, you can do this. You just need to figure out what are my talents, self-awareness, don't be jealous of people who have communication because let's be honest, we also have our issues. We talk too much. <laughs> and then after self-acceptance comes self-regulation. I, w- I want to move across to other, other. I don't want to call it issues, but other areas, so away from the personality, where people will struggle. Let's say they struggle to articulate themselves based on an accent or a second language or other things which are going to hold them back. Mm -hmm. Is this areas that you work with people on as well? I mean, you are very well spoken. You, uh, you know, I'm thinking accents as well because you have some Australian in there. You have a lot of Australian in there, (laughs) but there's, they're a very refined accent that you have obviously developed over time of being in front of a camera and being a very clear speaker. Is this an area that you help people with? Do you think it's important that people work on these skills? Broadly, yes. Uh, And thank you for the compliment and very good observation. Yes, of course, uh, my Australian background is hard to hide, but 27 years in Singapore and and English isn't my first language. So you're able to lose uh, accents fairly quickly. The thing about accents though, is that we're in a a global world where, uh, especially in a multicultural city like Dubai, I mean, you've got people from dozens of countries here. The, the issue of having an accent is not as great as it might have been 50 years ago, where it was unusual to see somebody from another country, perhaps, right? So, well, and yet, you have to be clearly understood. That's it. Right? So, how do we help people with that? Um, there, there are two aspects to this. The first is the personality one, and the other one is the, the, the tips and tricks, I guess. From a personality perspective, most people who have who are subject matter experts. Um, When they get into their comfort zone speaking about it, they actually become quite fluid. In fact, just before our podcast today, I had a guest from Thailand. And if you know anything about the Thai accent, Mm -hmm. it's, it's quite strong and often difficult to understand for those people who are not used to it. Yes. But senior business leader, he's been around for many years. He's about as old as I am. When he spoke, and by the way, he also had a belief mindset, uh, and because he's in financial services, he spoke with such passion and conviction about financial inclusion. Mm -hmm. His belief mindset came through in that domain that actually his accent didn't matter anymore. His accent was became more fluid. His delivery became more fluid because he was able to speak to something that he was comfortable with. And so if we can help people to understand which comfort zone are you most fluid in and getting into that mindset then solves part of the part of the problem. Now, clearly, that's not going to solve all the problems. Exactly. And with apologies to all my Scottish friends, even as a as a, you know, English speaker, sometimes it's very, very difficult to understand. Yes, we, um, (laughs) you know, we um, uh, obviously you need to be able to figure out. Slow down, enunciate clarity broadly yes yeah. broadly yes uh an enunciation uh is is a, is a critical part of that the the issue though then goes to the next step you know how much do we want to homogenize everybody to speak with the king's english um 
And that, that also then loses a lot of the richness and texture that we hear in people's accents. So I firmly believe that if you have an accent, it's true to you. It's a part of your culture. It's a part of your background. It's who you are. And when people come to me, and they say, I want to change my accent. I say, well, what accent would you like to have? Yes. Do you want to be British? you want to be Queens British? Do you want to be American? Which part of America do you want to come from? Yes. And, and I think that's just not right. You are who you are. And that's a part of your culture and people will connect with you and understand you know, based on how you speak. Yes, that's true. But there are areas that some people do need to work on. There are certain sounds in some languages that don't come across. And if you are speaking English and presenting in English, then it has to be clear and understood for everybody, no matter your nationality. And so I am Australian, but... Most people don't know that I'm Australian because I've adapted my accent over the years by living in multiple different countries yes. and dealing with lots of different nationalities. So you eventually speak with clarity in mind yes. and that adapts your your own accent. Indeed, and, and delightfully uh, neutral. Uh, and, and, and so similarly in broadcasting, you know, you spend your time thinking about how am I sounding? Am I able to sound understandable by by most uh, listeners in a stage presentation you have you have a, a choice actually for ensuring that you are clearly understood you know on stage these days unlike the 20th century uh, stage presentations are far more conversations these days true uh, and and you know teams and zoom thanks to the pandemic has brought about a lot of that you know when we're watching a presentation on zoom it's no longer like we you know we're in the 35th row in a conference hall somewhere completely disconnected from the from the presenter up there at the rostrum mm -hmm. we we we're, we're disintermediated right we we are right there we yep. are able to open our microphones or send a message and the speaker will get it in this environment where audiences expect to be able to interact with you this interaction is not only imperative because quite honestly if if, if the presenter isn't giving the audience something to do, they'll find something to do, mm -hmm. right? They'll toggle across to email or get on with work while you're giving your presentation. But the interaction is also essential to ensuring that your audience understands you. And so I'm, I'm a big fan of asking a check-in question yes. to establish that what you've said actually has landed and, and there are some, obviously, some techniques around that. But but I, I simply wouldn't go through a presentation anymore, even with a fairly neutral um, and, and self-aware accent, where I wouldn't be checking in with the audience to, to ensure that they've heard and heard correctly. Yeah, I, I firmly believe that's important. I did a, a speech presentation a couple of weeks back to a whole room full of fitness coaches and consultants, and all the way through it, I'm asking asking them to participate, getting them to do things uh, mm. so that there's constant engagement and curiosity from them. I even sang yes. to them. <laughs> really? <laughs> Would you like to do that now? No, not really. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'll, I'll demonstrate what I did. So I was talking about the voice mm. and how we have three different voices. You have a chest voice, you have a middle voice, and you have a head voice. And then I demonstrated this from a singing perspective because we all understand that from a singing perspective. So mm -hmm. I sang a bit of Adele. Never mind, I'll find someone like you. And then I went to middle voice. Never mind, I'll find someone like you. And then I went to head voice. Never mind, I'll find someone like you. So wow. demonstrating to them that, that, that to them. And then I got them all singing and playing with their voice so they could feel vibrations and, uh, wow. and, and get, get that understanding of how they've got such a powerful instrument inside, but most people don't use it. I am in awe. It's amazing. <laughs> but you're, you're right. Now, clearly, lots of business leaders would not sing from the stage unless they have a positivity mindset which is your number 13 people with positivity can't help but to sing um, but th there is a there is so much untapped potential in people's voices and yes. it's it's and because they're not in broadcasting they're not on stage they like haven't you and learned I. presenting they haven't learned um, yeah how to project their voice That's it. and they've never felt the need to I guess that's or, it so, so techniques like pitch, pace, volume, silence, un unfortunately, aren't as, as widespread as they should be. True. 
which is a lot of what I teach people, how to tap into that part of their speaking skills, building on skills and discovering. I get people to tune their ears and their voice and their thoughts together. So when we speak, we speak with intention. We speak in a, in a way that you're saying it like this because you want it to land like this. So you can connect with emotion. Mm -hmm. So if you only speak always at one level, people don't know how to read your emotion because it's everything is only there. But the minute you add a bit of melody, you mm. suddenly sound more interested, more curious. Gosh, sounds like I should sign up for you. <laughs> um, although I think you you have very poor raw material to work with in my case from a singing perspective. But you see that the self-awareness that you describe about the voice is the self-awareness that I preach when it comes to personality. If we're not self-aware about our voice, are we really making the best of it? No, exactly. It's if we're not self-aware about our personalities, are we making the best of it? Yeah. Um, on on the em the uh, emotional front, this uh, unfortunately also introduces a certain level of complexity. There are two types of uh, two extremes, you might say, two contrasting talent themes, which determine whether somebody will speak with emotion or not. Um, okay, I'm curious. Yes. So your number twenty-eight, analytical, isn't just your ability to analyze. Oops. Let's try that again. Right, people with analytical definitely do not want to get swept up in emotion. They, they can, of course, show emotion, but they take great delight in sticking to the facts, speaking in logical terms. Um, they're very good usually in communicating data points because they are delightfully unadulterated by emotion. Mm. The facts speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. The numbers don't lie. And it's certainly true that people who have analytical do on occasion come across as a tad robotic, right? But that's their conscious choice, that they don't want to get swept up in emotion. And so as coaches, obviously, the aim is then to help them to see that that's not the only way that will work. Yes, we do need logos, as Aristotle said, right? We need to convey information, but we also need the pathos. We need the emotional aspect to convince. You know, Aristotle came up with this 2,300 years ago. Yep. Um, and then there's empathy at the other extreme. So people with empathy arguably are sometimes a bit too emotional. They're, they're, they're your, your friend or colleague or maybe family member who cries in happy movies, not just the sad ones, who, who tears up. Um, That's my daughter. <laughs> all right, yes. Right, and, and people with, with, with empathy aren't just empathetic. We can all be empathetic, yeah. right? They, they are hardwired to make gut feel decisions, to take emotion into account at all stages. They often can't help but to tap into emotion. And, and for them, of course, they'll definitely bring out the pathos, right? The, um, the, the, the emotional aspect of the story. And sometimes we need to help them to also bring out the facts and we do need data points to make accurate decisions we can't just rely on gut feel yeah it's it's so interesting do you know i i think this is something that should be done in schools i think teenagers if they can start to understand their strengths their just their personalities better they will have a better understanding of also maybe even where they want to go in Absolutely. their careers Yes. In life. Could not agree more. Uh, in fact, it, it is a crying shame that this isn't already being done. Now, and I hasten to add, I don't make any money from you taking your Gallup uh, Clifton strengths, right? Uh, but the fact is that most people's lives would actually turn out very different if they had a better yeah. idea of who they were, you know. And, and if you have uh, situations where you might say, you know, I always wondered why I react a certain way. I, always, I wonder why I always say a certain thing. The chances are that it is actually to be found in your Clifton Strengths report. Now, with students and teenagers, you would want them to take the assessment from about the age of 16 or 18, not 13. Right. Right, because that's I our agree. formative years. Mm. And, and arguably, as a parent, your job actually is to be mindful of what personality traits are you actually imparting on your kids? Mm. We're all products of nature and nurture. So when you, for example, when you have a maximizer talent like you, I'm out on a limb here, but it's eminently possible that 
you were driven to excellence as a child. Your parents had very high expectations of you. Yes, they did. Yeah. Right. And so you've now brought that with you into your adult life. Empathy is another one. People who have an empathy mindset didn't become sensitive necessarily by nature. There was that predisposition. But there's a good chance that if you do cry even in happy movies and and you always tap into your intuitiveness, there's a good chance that you grew up in a house with a domineering mum or dad. And surviving in that house meant that you had to read the vibe very carefully. You didn't want to be asking for a raise in pocket money just when you got the sense that dad is in a bad mood or mum is really angry right now. And so as a child, you develop the sensitivity, which once again you then bring into your adult life. Mm. Um, restorative is another one, and I don't want to hack around on people with restorative, uh, but you know, there's a good chance that you grew up in a house where you were frequently criticized and your shortcomings were constantly pointed out to you. Right, so as parents, we do have that obligation in in, our, in the formative years of our children. Yeah, that's true. To, do you have children? Of that. I do, I have two, yes. And their age? 22 and 19. Okay, and have they done the test? Oh, of course, yeah. absolutely. And and so that, that was also insightful because they are so different. Yeah. Uh, and as I said, it's a mixture of nature and nurture. The best way to illustrate this is by means of a painting. Um, let's say, well, let's just take the painting here behind us. Right, you can see it has a white canvas. That's nature. And let's say your parents and their parenting style is blue paint. So you splash on some blue paint on a white canvas. What color is your painting? Blue on white? It's still blue. It's still blue. Your brother or sister was born with a yellow canvas. But they grew up in the same house mm -hmm. as you with the same parents splashing blue paint on their yellow canvas, which means their painting is... Turning green. Green. So that would explain why you and your siblings are so different. Mm. It also answers the Mozart question. Would Mozart have become a composer if he'd grown up in a different house? The answer is probably no. Mm. He might have had the natural predispositions, but if it wasn't the environment, Nurtured. the nurture. Incidentally, culture isn't paint on the painting. Culture is the frame around the painting. So culture, in essence, shapes the painting, yes. but the painting doesn't change. And, and this explains why when you have, let's say, somebody from Japan, where we would think that the culture enforces certain rigidities, if they have seven influencing talents like you, and it's entirely possible that they do, they would probably, the colors, their personality colors, would probably come out more in an American frame mm. or an Australian frame where they are able to able be themselves. To, yeah. Similarly, we see the same in reverse. You know, if you are quiet, um, uh, perhaps conforming, you know, conforming is your comfort zone. Maybe you have a discipline and a consistency talent. Maybe your colors shine brighter in Japan mm -hmm. because there is something to conform to, yeah. something to be consistent with. So you call these talents, which means for me a talent is something which you're born into. It's something which is a part of your DNA or which you, as you can nurture, you can, you can then build it into a skill. But a talent for me is um, something which you have. It's yes. part of you. Yes, very much so. Now, once again, you take this report, not at birth, but at the age of around 18 or yeah. older. And perhaps no surprisingly, it actually has a DNA at the top of the page to show you what your personality DNA might be, right? You can see yeah. that across there. Yes, yeah. um, but it still leaves the possibility open, firstly, to nurture, having an impact. Yes. The reason why we have, why we call life-changing events life-changing. They don't actually change our lives. They change us. Mm. So your personality does evolve. Yes. But over time, don't take the Clifton Strengths Assessment every year. Take it once every 10 or 15 years. Yeah. At most. Right. Other, otherwise, it becomes a moving target. Mm. Um, or, you know, those life changing events shape us. They, they physically rewire the synapses in your brain. Marriages, divorces, births, deaths, yeah. accidents, yeah, yeah. trauma, right? Yeah. There is a physical rewiring going on. Often I find people who become religious, when they find God, their heads rewire. Mm. So, so it is possible to change. You're not set in stone. But it's certainly much easier to say, who am I 
and now how do I make the most of that than to say I'm going to I'm going to start 10 meters back from the starting line and I'm going to try to win this race well good luck to you yeah. you know you're better off taking advantage of the head start you yeah. have yeah you'll get to the finish line much quicker this has been such an interesting conversation Mark I've really enjoyed it and I'm sure the listeners are going to enjoy it as well I'm going to put all the links to your book, to where we can find you if companies want to bring you in to train their their staff to build on their strengths and their skills. We'll put all of the links below. But where can we find you if you just want to join you on social? Are you on social? Yes. Uh, LinkedIn, Mark Laudy. Very simple. So LinkedIn's your, LinkedIn your is, go-to uh, platform. For, for social, it certainly is. Uh, and uh, you can always reach out to me. Thank you so much for coming on and in sharing all of these incredible insights. Thank you for being here. And uh, yeah, we'll maybe do it again in 10 years. <laughs> thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. Absol- thank you. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Impact Through Voice podcast. Now, if you've reached the end of this episode, then it means you're enjoying the podcast. So I have a quick favor to ask. If you haven't yet subscribed, please go and do it now and even leave us a review because it really does help us so much to reach more people and impact more people. And I would be very, very grateful. Now, I love to read all of your comments about the show and what you're enjoying, what you would like to hear more of so please take the time and go and do that now when you do that please take a screenshot and then tag me on facebook or instagram that's lisa hugo official you know i'm going to be sure to share your post and i'm also going to private dm you with a thank you and it also means you won't miss an episode and as a subscriber then you're going to get access to more content that we don't even open up to everybody so thanks again and until next time keep on working towards your goals and making a positive impact on the world with your voice.